I am Daniel Lucas, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He is the author of several books, no other than Mr. John Palladino. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Welcome to Book 101, Mr. John, and can you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm a self-published author of uh, The Trials of Ashmount and uh, the sequel, uh, Buzzard's Bowl, which comes out June 1st. Uh, it's the first two books in my Tragedy of Sedane series, which is a grimdark fantasy, uh, kind of in the vein of like a joe abercrombie or george r R. martin type uh, book wow sounds interesting mr gant what age did you realize that you are good in writing (laughs) that's a that's an interesting question uh because i've been writing for most of my life but i've always thought that i was terrible at writing so um I, i i started writing like I wrote my first book when I was a junior in high school, but I don't think I thought I was good enough to write a book that I could publish until I was 32, 33. I don't remember exactly how old I was, I guess, but it was just a couple of years ago. So who encouraged you to uh, do your writing? Uh, when I was in high school, um, I had a f- my best friend, and we used to both write, and we, we would uh, go to like uh, a, a bookstore that had a, uh, a Starbucks in it as well. So we would go there and write, uh, and then we'd kind of trade our laptops and read what we wrote and give each other feedback. And during that whole process, uh, I, I think I was just encouraged to one day write a book that I actually put out there. So I, I guess it would be my friend back in high school. And because of that process and because I actually wrote an entire book back then, um, I think I was always just inspired to make sure I finished a book. Uh, and, and I mean, I finished a book in high school, but I meant like finish a book that's uh worth publishing and so that's uh kind of what i did when uh covid happened it was right after uh everything shut down that i ended up quitting my job and that's when i really sat down and started writing yes that's the good side of covid don't you think (laughs) i mean i uh i'm someone who really enjoys like staying at home to begin with so um I, I never had a big problem with the – actually, I really enjoyed 2020, um, which I know is kind of crazy because a lot of people hated that year. But, man, that was one of my favorite years I've ever lived because I didn't have to go anywhere. Uh, I didn't have to talk to anyone. <laughs> it's pretty <really> great. <laughs> Definitely, because I, I read on your bio or your Amazon profile, you're hibernating at home. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yep, I, I do. I, ever since uh, COVID started happening, I I honestly haven't left the house all that much. <laughs> <laughs> Who are your favorite authors? Uh, so I would say that my number one favorite author is Joe Abercrombie. My second favorite author is probably George R. R. Martin. They're my two biggest influences. And Recently, I started reading uh, Robin Hobb, and she is uh, also really good. And uh, Peter McLean is also a really good author that I just discovered uh, at the beginning of this year. If you describe your favorite authors, how they write, what is it, or what are they? What like what? Uh, like, do you mean how? Uh, like my favorite parts about how they write or how uh, perhaps they write that everyone likes maybe. Yes. How, how do you describe their writing? Uh, I think that 
all of my favorite authors tend to have like a similar uh, way of going about things, which is uh, they, they can really surprise you with uh, different things that happens. Uh, so all the authors I just listed kind of have this uh, habit of doing something really surprising that you don't expect. And then it just like shocks you. And so, uh, but it always makes sense. So I, I think that all of my favorite authors are really good at uh, characters and then doing things that characters, uh, doing surprising things with characters that still fit the character, but also surprise the reader. So did you get those uh, characteristics uh, in your writing? I think so. Uh, I try and do the same thing where I have... A, a pretty large cast and then the characters are pretty well defined and uh, they might do some really surprising things, but for reasons or because the characters uh, been defined already to do that. And so it's not really a surprise that they're doing it because it fits the character, but at the same time, it, um, it might be surprising because it's like, well, why, what, why did the author just let this character do that? That's crazy. Uh, so I try and do that. Uh, whether or not I succeed, I guess, is up to the readers. What are your long-term and short-term goal in writing? Uh, well, short-term goal is uh, right now I am writing the third book in my series. And I also have a short story anthology set in the same world being worked on. And... Then after I write the third book in the series, I have to write uh, the last book. That's going to be a four book series. And hopefully that'll be no more like finished no more than uh, two years from now. And once I have that all done, I have a lot of plans. I have, I, I do want to eventually continue the series uh, by doing so once the series is finished, I do have two standalone novels set in the same universe planned and then a sequel series planned. But I don't know if I'm going to jump right into that after I finish the first series or if I'm going to uh, write something different because I have I have a few other ideas that I'm really interested in pursuing. And uh, I don't want to say that I'm bored of the world in my first series. But I am really interested in like branching out and trying something completely different. Yes, definitely. Let's talk about your debut novel, The Trials of Ashman. What behind the title? Okay, so the the title is uh, referencing a magical school, which is called Ashmount. Uh, it's a it's a magical school that's at the base of a uh, active volcano and the school is shielded by this uh, magical shield and they are kind of an exclusive uh, organization. So they'll, they'll have a bunch of people come to the school and see if they possess the magical ability that will allow them to then enter what's called the trials and during the trials uh, a lot of entrants do tend to die because they are uh, pretty brutal but it's uh, trying to find the best people for uh, the organization and so the trials of Ashmount actually has five points of view uh, but there's kind of one that's a little bit more uh, main in this book that i guess that's why it's named after this uh point of view character uh Keldon. he's the one that goes to ash mountain to try and get into the school uh and and then you, you kind of start to see uh, that there's a few hints that maybe something is not quite right with this process uh so that's why it's called uh the trials of ash mount and then uh, since it's a four book series, I actually had this kind of plan where each book was going to focus a little bit more on a different character. And that's what the names kind of uh, hint at. 
the trials of Ashman, how do you crafted it? When I started writing, I had a, 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 when I started writing this book, I had a very basic plan and it was mostly focused on uh, two characters, Keldon, who is the one that I mentioned that goes to the school. And then I had another character in mind and he was a nobleman who I wanted to have get betrayed basically. And then I just kind of started writing it. And as I went, uh, things just kind of evolved. Uh, I will say that my magic system, I've always actually had in my head. I created this magic system when I was in high school. And the basic premise of the magic system is that uh, your your magic is tied to your life. So you can do things like uh, I'm going to start a fire or I'm going to summon a big fireball and, you know, bring it down on an army. But the more major a thing that you do, the more of your own life you're spending. So if I want to start a fire, maybe it'll add a couple or subtract a couple minutes of my life. So I'll kind of get a tiny bit older as I'm doing these things, but you won't probably notice it. But if you do something a little bit more or a little bit uh, more taxing, then you'll start to age a lot faster. And if you do something like really crazy, you can go from being like a 20 year old person to being like an 80 year old person. So the, you don't have unlimited magic. You have a very, uh, you know, finite amount. It ages you as you go. You kind of know as you progress through using it, uh, how far you are in your life. So it's really, uh, I think an interesting system because you have to make a choice every time you think about using magic, you have to think like, is it worth doing this? Because I'm going to be spending my life to do it. So when yes. I came up with that system, that's, I guess, I, I don't know. I just built the book around that, really. Very well said, Mr. John. This is trilogy or will be a series? It, it's a four book series. Oh, it's a four book series. So how did you connect the story to each other without spoiler? So I, I mentioned earlier that each book is uh, focused on like a different character. And um, it's so some series you have like the books are kind of like this book. The first book is like a complete story. The second book is like a complete story. But then they're kind of still sequels and run together. Uh, but then there's like other books that kind of bleed into one another. So like my first book does kind of end with a few cliffhangers and it just like starts the next book starts like right at the beginning of that. So I would say that my book series is kind of like one continuous story uh, where the end kind of like will pick up exactly uh at the beginning of the next volume in the series uh, because when you have five points of view, it's kind of really hard to wrap them all up at the end of each book. I've noticed. Uh, I think I did a lot better with book two at maybe making an ending that was a bit less cliffhangery, but uh, since the story is not like, different stories for each book it's a little difficult not to have it like end with like a cliffhanger i guess or a a need to know more um but you know i i, I tried to end them in ways that were somewhat satisfying but not not upsetting because i don't want to write a cliffhanger that's too annoying where you have to like wait to find out if uh you know, someone died or whatnot, if, if I wouldn't do that, I like to clarify, like, you know, this is what happened. There might be a major event that happens right in the end of a book, but uh, I don't want anyone to be like disappointed that they didn't get the resolution that they wanted. And 
But at the same time, I think that might also be a little bit difficult to do. Uh, you know, if you're writing a series that's like Game of Thrones, for example, because each of those books kind of ends and you're like, this is not a great ending. You know, famously, <laughs> Martin ended uh, number five with some crazy things. And then, you know, it's been over, what, 12 years since that book, I think. So <laughs> Yes, <laughs> definitely. And congratulations. I think you're number 52. According to Amazon, you are number 52 in military fantasy. Why is it categorized your W novel in a military fantasy? What I did was uh, when I published The Trials of Ashmount, I noticed that some authors were saying that if you publish your book, you should check the categories that Amazon automatically puts you in. And then you can email Amazon and have them add other categories and so i noticed the categories that amazon put me in were pretty normal like epic fantasy dark fantasy and uh when i looked up military fantasy they didn't actually put my book into military fantasy but i saw a lot of books that i would compare my book to that were in military fantasy so i actually emailed them and had them put it into it that category even though I don't necessarily know if uh, it fits military fantasy, but it does fit a lot of the books that are in military fantasy. But as far as I know, military fantasy mostly involves, uh, you know, lots of battles and war and, uh, and deaths and stuff. I, that is in my book. It's in, you know, Game of Thrones. It's in Joe Abercrombie's books. And all those books are in that category. So I figured if that is where a lot of the books that are similar to mine are. I should probably uh, just submit that category to add on because Amazon didn't actually uh, do that for me. So The Trials of Ashman, do you think this is a standalone that there's no prerequisite to your other books? Yeah, yeah. You, def you definitely, if you just read The Trials of Ashman, uh, you probably wouldn't be happy with, the way it ends because it, it definitely it definitely goes right into the second book so the trials of ashman what do you think the flaws the flaws yes hmm i mean honestly i i think this is both a flaw and a strength is uh i write very simple prose so i'm not like really poetic or wordy i guess um some people don't like that because they like really smart writing uh as a reader myself i can't stand that type of writing uh, i'm a simple guy and i like you know simple writing that i can just read through pretty quickly so i would say that a flaw is if you like complicated uh poetic writing you're certainly not going to like my book because it's not that are you the writer that you plan first then you go to the deep end of the story oh so am i a plotter or a pantser um yes yeah a gardener or an architect <laughs> oh yes yep that's an, yeah, true that's another uh I think that a lot of people actually like that one more. I always just forget those words. Uh, I am definitely a gardener. Uh, I think when I, when I started writing the book, I had the magic system already figured out, but that's not because I planned it beforehand. It's just because I created that system when I was like a kid. Uh, it did kind of expand on it a lot when I started writing, but the only thing I plotted was when I got halfway through the trials of Ashmount, I realized if I didn't know the end of the four book series, that that might be a problem. So I came up with the ending of the series and that's the only thing I've really plotted. As I keep writing, I get these ideas I develop in my head and I kind of, plan for those to happen later on but i don't really plot them out or anything like that and even the ending that i plotted is just uh, a general plot point i have no idea 
who's going to actually live until the end or anything like that. Are you the writer that you give balance to the villain and the hero? So I write uh, Grimdark, and most of my characters are kind of bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I have, uh, you know, I have a few characters that you might think are good, but they'll probably do something really bad at some point for uh, selfish reasons or self-preservation or... Uh, you know, uh, whatever. And then I have people that are a lot more of what you'd probably consider like evil characters, but uh, generally they have motivations or reasons for being that way that, you know, you can kind of believe they're not just like, uh, I'm bad because I like to be bad for the most part. I mean, there is some of that because they take enjoyment out of, you know, making other people suffer. Uh, but for the most part, I'd say most of my characters are kind of uh, in between, you know, some are a little bit better than others, but in the end, people in my series are much more about uh, them, like their self and the things that they care about rather than trying to do the good thing for, for the uh, whole world or rather or the opposite of that, like just trying to be evil for the sake of evil. There's usually some sort of motivation there and uh, understandable reason for it happening. Yes, and according to Michael Roberti, he's uh, my guest last month, he's saying that it's bloody, bold, and restless. How bloody it is, your story. <laughs> Uh, there is quite a bit of violence in my book, I would say. Uh, book two is even worse when it comes to that. Uh, so it's, it's pretty uh, pretty bloody, I would say. How bold it is. Well, according to Mike, <laughs> pretty bold, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he, will be, he will be my guest next week for the second book of his trilogy. Oh, nice. Yeah, Mike's a good dude. Yes, he's one of a kind, like you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike's review. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I, I think what he's trying to say is that, um, yeah. So it says to me, it's the conundrum of a first round quarterback in their first few seasons in the NFL. There are a lot of wow moments, but every so often it just barely misses the mark. So I think that, for the most part. He's saying it's impressive, but then, you know, there's a few flaws, um, which is fine. You know, not everyone is going to rate a book five out of five. Uh, Mike rated it a four out of five, which is still a solid rating. Uh, he had some uh, qualms with it, uh, which I think was uh, like some of the characterizations uh he wanted to have elaborated more but then he says things like uh you know the scale and the scope of the story is really good and uh, actually i'll just read the actual quote right here why am i trying to uh, paraphrase he says on the other hand the sense of scale and scope of the story is brilliant very few writers could juggle that so well let alone in their debut as an indie author uh so that's really cool and then at the end he continues the football analogy by saying, if authors were quarterbacks and my team drafted John, I would be very excited for the future. <laughs> so maybe he's a, a football guy. I don't know. Um, I, I actually never asked him about that. I should. Yes. Uh, I will ask him, okay? <laughs> okay. I will, I will, uh, you will be my guest next week. So I'm going to ask about uh, this uh, comment. Mr. John. What else you can say about your debut novel? It's a very fast-paced book. And if you like, I mentioned Abercrombie and Martin earlier. So I would say that The Trials of Ashmount has like Abercrombie-type characters in a George R.R. Martin world with a Brandon Sanderson type of magic system. Actually, there's two magic systems in my book uh, that are completely different from each other. So... It's got two 
Brandon Sanderson magic systems in it. (laughs) (laughs) And by that, I mean hard and defined and they have rules. And so you know what to expect with uh, the magic, I think. Uh, At least there's not going to be any like crazy surprises that like a soft magic system has. Definitely. So before we go, and I want to shout out to the people listening in Sweden. Oh my goodness, the most livable city in the world. So in Stockholm County, I got 41%, Stockholm at 24%, and John Copping at 15%, Vistra Gotland County at 9%, Dalarna County at 3%, Vastra Gotland at 3%, Uppsala at 3%, Iskain County at 3%, and last but not the least is Kane at three percent thank you Sudan for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world like Mr. John Palladino so what are the pros and cons of indie author or indie publishing uh well I think the most immediate uh pro is that you can kind of do whatever you want but I, then an immediate con is that you have to pay for everything yourself. So you can write as long of a book as you want, but you still have to pay somebody to edit it. And editing can be expensive. You know, you have to pay for cover art and cover art is expensive. And so it's kind of, you're investing your own money into it. And then when you finally publish, you have to do a lot of marketing. And while traditional authors also have to do their self marketing, uh, it's, it feels like from an indie point of view, a lot harder because we don't have a publisher backing us and just saying that, you know, orbit published my book gives you a huge step up in terms of credibility, because when you're self published, you are battling against a lot of books that are out there. And unfortunately, I don't like to say this, but unfortunately, a lot of self-published authors don't put in the proper effort, money, time. And so there is a lot of crap out there, but there's also a lot of really good uh, indie books out there too. But when there's so much of it, it's really hard for random readers to just kind of like know one way or the other if, uh, you know, is your book good? Is it not good? But if I said, you know, Tor or Orbit or whoever picked me up, people are going to expect the, a certain like quality from that because the publishing houses have access to all these uh, resources that we do not. So it's that's I think that's the major uh, pros and cons to it. But the nice thing is that if you do well with self-publishing, you tend to make more money than a traditional author, but it is harder, I think, to make a decent amount of money as a self-published author than as a traditional one. Uh, uh, It's hard to really make that a fact because I've never been traditionally published. So I don't really know, but from, you know, what I do know, it seems likely. Yeah. There's a lot of indie, uh, indie author that they, manage to be successful this podcast is created to empower like you mr jan so anytime you can come and promote your books because this podcast have uh, according to my analytics there are 100 133 countries listening to me so totally free and empower people like you well thank you for having me on the podcast i appreciate that and that's that's a lot of countries that's really great Yes, so the trials of Ashmond. Okay. Or the or the main character. Sure. So there's there's kind of five main characters. You have uh Keldon who is uh going to Ashmount for the uh chance to join the magical school. Uh then you have Edelbrock, and Edelbrock is a nobleman who is trying to get rich quick by doing some really bad things. And unfortunately, he kind of gets caught and uh, betrayed a little bit while doing it. Uh, Then we have uh, Demry. Uh, Demry is actually a character who already went to Ashmount. He already went through the trials. He already learned from the school. He is a mage 
uh, but he learned, you know, some things. He became a uh, kind of went against the rules, I guess, of the organization because he was trying to pursue some knowledge of some sort that I don't want to get into for spoilers. But he uh, ends up becoming this uh, criminal who's running from them and hiding from them. And he's been on the run from them for a long time. And he's, uh, he's got this stutter. So I actually write out his stutter in the dialogue. Uh, I don't know why I chose to do that, but I did. And I really liked how it worked. Uh, and he is very okay with it. He doesn't care that he stutters. He doesn't change the way he speaks to uh, try and not stutter. He just uh, owns it and doesn't give a shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So the fourth major uh, point of view character is Sarah, and she is a girl who lives with her family in the cold northern country. Uh, she raises birds, and she kind of gets caught up in this war that starts happening in her country. And then there's one last character that's a main character, and his name is Vilik. And he's part of the nomadic uh, clans, and they're called the Camel Clans, and they kind of war with one another all the time. Uh, and then something strange happens to Vilik. He wakes up one day, and he has a voice in his head. And uh, the, this is like a new form of magic, but it's... Uh, it's kind of freaking him out because Vilik is a very shy, very uh, introverted person. He is very uh, God fearing. So there, the camel clans worship like multiple gods and he's very afraid of them, but also wants to uh, impress them at the same time. And so he's afraid that the voice in his head is actually like one of these gods. And, and so he really forms this like, uh, interesting relationship with the voice in his head and starts to learn about this uh, new form of magic. But at the end of the day, he is still kind of just a, a shy, very, very shy man. He just gets super nervous whenever anyone talks to him. He has it. His camel is his best friend and he doesn't really want to talk to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> interesting characters. So according to even Rice, is stunning debut. So what are the elements you put in your stories to make it the reader say, oh, this is stunning? Well, I really tried to focus on uh, the magic systems, for one, and tried to create unique and original uh, systems because I thought, you know, cool magic is always fun. And then I really wanted to focus on making uh, really unique interesting characters that people could connect with whether or not i did that is subjective i suppose some people say i have great abercrombie like characters while other people say that i you know the characters are lacking but i suppose it's going to happen with every book uh it just depends on how you connect with them or not so i i would say that i really focused on magic characterization and uh world building i i I feel like I did decent with those three things. As your debut novel, what did you learn from it? I learned a lot. I, uh, I, so after I finished writing the book, I hired an editor and I did a developmental edit. And that was so much work. It was insane. But through that developmental edit process, I learned how to write a lot better, I think. So I wasn't really thinking as I was writing the first book about some different things, you know, like consistency and timelines and, and uh, making sure that everything always like made sense. Like I tried to obviously when I was writing it, but I just, I don't think I was consciously as aware about like some of the things that I am now. So when I wrote the second book, the amount of editing I had to go back and do was like way less, which was awesome. <laughs> That's be awesome. What are your struggles in writing 
your Dabi Nabo? Hmm. I think that uh, writing every day, which is what I tried to do until I finished the book, that didn't happen. Uh, really, I found out that I kind of have a strange habit of working where I will work really hard on like writing a book for a month or two and I'll write quite a bit in that time almost every day and then I'll just kind of like burn out <laughs> I won't okay. do like any work on the book for a couple months almost and then I'll pick right back up and do another couple months of just like crazy work and then I have I have like the book finished and if you go to your reviews, there's a uh, word over there that concedes all your readers talk about it. And I will tell you the word and let me know what you think. Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. And it says dark fantasy. Okay. Yeah. What can you say about dark fantasy? Uh, dark fantasy is such a weird term to me because... Uh, when I think of dark fantasy, I think of kind of like grimdark or, uh, you know, adult mature fantasy, you know, there's swearing and there's, you know, grim and brutal things that happen. Uh, ironically enough, though, if you go to dark fantasy, there is a lot of like romance in that section. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know, I don't get upset when people call it dark fantasy. I'm in the dark fantasy category. Uh, it's just, I always think about how the the category is just like overrun by like romance and stuff. And it's just kind of funny. Yes. Magic system. Uh, hmm. Well, I think that one makes sense because there's two magic systems and the magic systems take uh, like a, a big part of the book. Yes. Single thing. Uh, what was the word? Single thing. He's saying that book and you must pay attention as what's going on so you don't miss a single thing. Uh, <laughs> that is all about single thing. Okay. Well worth. Hopefully people are saying it's well worth buying. <laughs> <laughs> According to uh, Sweden, Eric Sevens on Sweden, well worth the read. Great. Uh, That's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to uh, make a play of this. So before we go on, Mr. John, I want to invite you to my other podcast, uh, Food 101, on our third season with Chef Alessandro one of the executive chef in one of the five-star hotel in downtown Toronto. And our latest episode is about Borch. So please still listen, Food 101. So Mr. John, can you please invite our listeners to buy all your boots? Yeah, if, uh, if anyone wants to try the Trials of Ash Mount, uh, you can find it on Amazon for only 99 cents or it's free if you have a kindle unlimited subscription uh so try it out it's uh not that expensive <laughs> yes it's one of a kind people so let's support mr john paladino because more and more books to come and the books are phenomenal don't you think mr john i have a hard time like praising my own books but yeah I'll go with that. They're phenomenal. <laughs> yes, they're phenomenal. <laughs> so what do you think uh, the Trials of Ashman is good for a series or a motion picture? Ooh, is it good for a motion picture? Yes, or um, a series. So that's funny that you asked that because as I was writing this book, <laughs> I was just visualizing so many things in it as like an HBO produced like series or something. So... Yeah, that would be, I think it would be really good as a TV show. I don't think they could make a movie out of it too well. I mean, who knows? But I think that it would be really hard to condense it into a movie. Yes. As I said, Mr. John, dream big. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, 
my dreams will be fulfilled when HBO is handing me that million dollar check. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I hope uh, the ending is better than Game of Thrones, okay? <laughs> you know, to be fair, that is a really low bar, so I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the authors that I uh, interviewed they like the ending of Game of Thrones, just like Luis Magalhães. He's uh, a Portuguese writer. Oh, I know him. Yes, he liked the ending of the Game of Thrones. He said, good or best. <laughs> what? I'm going to have to have some strong words with him. <laughs> yes, listen to my, <laughs> listen, listen to our episode, uh, I think last week or last month. Uh, he will be my guest again this week. This coming Tuesday. So again, uh, Mr. John, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me, Daniel. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bodycon people, see you soon.